everyone, and welcome to another conversation with Rob. Today, I have a very special guest, my good friend, Christopher Barnard, who is the founder and president of the BCA, the British Conservation Alliance. And it's my pleasure to have you here today, Chris. How are you? I'm good. Thank you very much for inviting me, Rob. Awesome. Um, so I came across you, oh my God, it must be about two and a half years ago now. And when I was the regional director with SFL um, and I was recruiting and I seen that you were interested in the ideas of liberty and you had, I think, just begun your final year at Kent and you were heavily involved in the um, Kent Classical Liberal Society. Um, maybe tell us a little bit about that. What was your experience like in Kent? Yeah, uh, well, first, I think, I think it wasn't actually two and a half years ago. I think it was more like a year and nine months ago. Like, it was, it's not actually that long ago. Oh, but it feels wow. like I've known you for ages. Yeah. Um, but yeah, because I, I joined in around October 2018. So, yeah, I guess not, wow. not, 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 not even two full years yet. So, um, but yeah, basically, basically at my campus in Kent, um, I was uh, with a few other friends. We were kind of getting frustrated at the direction of the of the debate uh, on campus is pretty hostile to free speech. Um, the only kind of uh, group that we could moderately agree with was was probably the conservative group, but they weren't. Um, they they would just tend to go down to the pub and not organize any interesting events or anything. So that wasn't really our cup of tea. So we thought, you know, we should we should kind of just invite our own guests, do our own thing, um, uh, kind of start having different conversations on campus and start kind of pushing back against the narrative there of, of everyone being left-wing students just caring about uh, like the government and, and those kinds of socialism and those kinds of things. So we, um, we actually decided when I was in my second year, um, and this was like six months before I even spoke to you, we decided that we want to go ahead with this and to found a, a libertarian society or a classical liberal society. But um, then we, ha we had to fill out like this whole bureaucratic process with the union of like, what is your constitution? Who's going to be in it? What, what do you stand for, etc. And we submitted it and, and like we heard nothing back. Then we emailed them a few months later. You're like, oh, sorry, we lost your application. Can you apply again? And we did that again. Hmm. And then again, we didn't hear anything for a few months. Uh, and then we apply uh, and then we email them again saying what happened and say, oh, sorry, we can't seem to find it in our records. Can you can you do it once more for us? Sorry about that. And and at, by this point, it was already the summer and we were we were all not at university anymore. And we said, OK, we, we were sending it and, and we wanted to really get it done by the time that fresher started in September. Um, so we put a lot of pressure. Be like, look, there's no reason for you to go against us. Like the principles that we outline here are just general political philosophical principles there's nothing controversial about it mm. and we obviously knew that they would have a bias against it but in the end we got it approved and we got a stand at freshers and so that was kind of the start of it um and then during that process we were we were kind of trying to figure out who to invite um how we would how the activism on campus would look like what events to do things like that um, and i think that's when uh, tom colsey my, my the co-founder with me uh, found out about students for liberty and, and I think, I'm not sure exactly how, I think he just did some research online and then followed the page or something. And then you reached out to him and then via him reached out to me as well. And then mm -hmm. we started kind of getting into a discussion on, oh, how can we work together and how can you support our activism at Kent? Um, and then we basically filled out the, um, the application online we were interviewed by uh, Maz, who was then the regional director. So this was actually after you had stopped being regional director. Yeah. Um, and so then we were interviewed by Maz, Lisa, and uh, Raf, um, who was the Scottish, na England or Scottish national? Yeah, coordinator? I think he was the national coordinator at the time. Yeah, of the UK. Yeah, and uh, and so then we um, then basically a few days later we heard okay we were accepted, and then we kind of unlocked this whole universe <laughs> of other people that believed in similar things and speakers and ideas and and swag and contacts and everything um so then we basically just started inviting people for events and uh, and you, you had know, some really big events actually that year yeah yeah we did i think we had around two and a half thousand attendees that year yeah um, across all our events um we started with uh, with the uh, sfl superhero vera kitchenova 
who was the the first ever elected libertarian in Russia, mm-hmm. and she gave gave a talk, and we just kind of promoted it on Facebook. Thought, okay, maybe if ten people come, they'll be really successful. But like forty people came, um, we had a bunch of SFL books there that people took away. We had um, the IEA sent us some things, and so that that was already really promising. I mean, this was someone. Uh, Vera is like well-known in libertarian circles, but not beyond it. But still, forty people decided to come on like a Wednesday evening and spend their time, and and uh, and so that was really cool. Um, but then we started kind of looking at like even bigger events, and 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 we the main thing that we wanted to focus on was we didn't want to provide just like an ideological echo chamber, mm. because that's what we felt universities are too much of. And if we were to provide just one speaker, only the people that agreed with that speaker would come. So we wanted mm. to broaden the debate. So we very much focused on having panel discussions or debates around issues that we personally were interested in. So we had a debate on capitalism versus socialism, which we as libertarians co-hosted with the Marxist Society, and they brought their own Marxist, and we brought our own capitalist, which was Yaron Brook. And, and you know, it was a debate. There were 200 people there. It was chaired by uh, Matthew Goodwin, who's uh, the most famous academic at Kent. And so it was, it was a real success, and people kind of actually got something out of something at university an educational thing yeah. imagine that at university <laughs> and um and so that was really 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 cool then we did another debate on feminism and, and what that looks like from a classical liberal perspective and we had joanna williams versus mm. um, a feminist then we had um, a discussion on nato um, and my favorite event was actually a debate we had uh, which we organized was the first ever debate at a uk university between a Palestinian and an Israeli diplomat. Right and uh, we brought together the Jewish society on campus and the Palestinian society. And we said, look, we're going to be the mediators here. I reached out to the embassies. Surprisingly, they both said, yeah, sure, we'll participate in a debate with certain conditions. Um, and then we had the debate in the biggest lecture theater on campus, Israeli security, secret agents everywhere. Um, and it was jam packed. I think we had like four or 500 people. Um, nice. And it was a pretty historic thing. Um, and I think, I think it's really important to, to focus on debates and discussions more than just having single speakers, because then there's not enough challenge to what they say. And mm. the people that tend to show up will probably agree with them because it's like their hero already or something. Uh, so we're really happy to like put on these debates and get like different opinions and things like that. So that was, that was a really, really kind of historic fun event that we were able to do. And I was just surprised that no one else was doing these things. I mean, it just seems so straightforward at a university, you host events on the most important discussions of the day, right? Capitalism versus socialism, Israel, Palestine, those issues that like everyone is talking about, but they're talking about to their own tribes and they're not talking about to the other side. And so I was even shocked that the university wasn't, wasn't doing this. Like if there were one thing that I would implement at any university, it would be an events team to put on actual educational events. And once you have the clout of the university, imagine the people you can invite. And Oxford does that really well with the Oxford Union. Mm. But, uh, but sometimes, like all this attention tends to go towards like Oxford and Cambridge, and the other universities like Kent, just they tend to just fall away. They don't really have much of that vibrant discussion that you need. Uh, so, so this is this is sort of a team across all of the UK, and in my experience, most of Europe that there is. The student unions push back against what you said there, like having that debate, having a real thorough examination of the the ideas uh, that are so important. And you you tend to get this left-wing bias. Why do you think that there is this left-wing bias in universities? Like what what is going on there, would you say? Um, I think... I think it genuinely partly is because there hasn't been enough challenge to the echo chamber. And, and so for example, when we first founded the society, all of a sudden, like dozens of people started like showing up to events that felt they had a platform to go to, whereas before they didn't. And it just showed that, that universities aren't actually necessarily echo chambers. It's just that institutionally they are, but the actual people that go there, you tend to just have a normal mix as you would have, in any society, some people left-leaning, some right-leaning, some in the middle, and and the right-leaning and, and the people in the middle were feeling they didn't have a voice and they couldn't express their opinions, and now all of a sudden they did. And so that's why we became the most popular society on campus with the most events and the most attendees, 
because all of a sudden all these people could come out of the woodwork and be like, oh, look, there's actually something here for me. So I think, I think it's not necessarily the students that's the problem. It's, it's more like the institutional bias where, where um, you have a few student activists. I mean, I have my own theories. I think, for example, the people that join the, the union or, or the people that, that aren't itching to go out into the workforce and like into the real world, they kind of want to stay in their cocoon at the university. So they run in student politics and they feel all important. Whereas um, most kind of libertarian or right-leaning people are often entrepreneurial. They want to get on with their lives. So they want to leave university as soon as possible mm. and start their business, start their job, something like that, start their organization. Uh, and so that's why I feel like many of those people tend to not want to be sucked into university politics because it's, it's rather pointless at the end of the day. Mm. Um, and so the people that remain are the people that have this kind of implicit bias. And and to be fair to them, I mean, there were, there were also people in the student union that, that just had this implicit bias, but they weren't trying to like impose left-wing politics. They just, they just kind of got sucked into this like identity politics, political correctness thing. So, so they just were looking after their own skin. So if you wanted to have a particularly controversial speaker, someone like Jacob Rees-Mogg, it was like, Ooh, we have to check if that's even allowed. It's because they, they themselves are kind of afraid to go against this orthodoxy that creates itself. Mm. It becomes like a self-sustaining beast. It's not like, there's someone in a room going like, Ooh, who we're going to ban this time. Yeah. It's more that they're just afraid and they're, they're unwilling to challenge that status quo. Um, and so I think that's, I think as soon as you do challenge it, then you see that there really is debate and, and, and people are willing to engage. And to be fair to the student union in the beginning, they probably didn't want us because they wanted to avoid the trouble that we might cause. So, I mean, we did end up causing trouble, but um, the main, the main, thing is that once we were established and we had these debates, they did work with us and they were willing, especially when we started organizing debates with other groups and showing that you can have that debate. Mm. And so as soon as you do that, you can really help people out of their own bubbles. Uh, but it's important to just be bold and go for it. Mm. Is the society still alive today? It is. Yes. Um, it was, they actually had some, another SFL -er, um, actually, well, three of them now. So Amelia Palmer, Alex struggles, and Connor Owen, uh, they they ran it this year, and and they had some really good events. Like they had a debate on abortion, for example, and what liberty and and the right to life means. Um, and they had um, a debate on religion and things like that. So also, like again, the debate format, which worked really well. Uh, but their year obviously got cut short by Corona. Mm. Um, so they had some other things that they had planned. I was going to speak actually at Kent, uh, but obviously that had to be cancelled. So, um, but but it is still there, and and. Alex is graduating now, but Amelia and Connor will still be there uh, next year. So they'll they'll uh, probably hope hopefully continue it and keep doing events. Fantastic! In large parts, last year um, the UK won an award for Group of the Year. In large parts, for the work that you did in Kent, um, I think that that's not too controversial to say. Um, <laughs> But in your experience, what what has your SFL um, tenure been like? Have you enjoyed it? Yeah, I've loved it, and and it's it's unlocked a whole like I said, it unlocked a whole new universe of things I had no clue about. And um, the SFL like business model of educating, empowering, the developing leaders is so incredibly successful in in that they don't their business model is built upon the idea that they will create leaders and you might not see the impact for the first few years, but you'll see it in 20 years. You'll see it in 30 years when they're mm. at the top of their fields and they're promoting these ideas that they've been equipped with. And then all of a sudden they're changing the world in their business. They're changing the world in politics, in academia, in the media, etc. And And so I think that's an incredibly successful kind of business model. Um, and, and it's just equipped me with like the resources, not only like the, intellectual theoretical ones of how does an economy work what is the free market what is capitalism etc but also just in terms of um practical skills how do you speak in front of a, an audience how do you put together a team how do you manage a project how do you um organize an event things like that uh, and on top of that they then just give you they bombard you with contacts here is this person there that will maybe help you get to where you want to be and then there's just just this self-sustaining network that we're rather than somebody going to the top, pushing someone else down, they go to the top, but bring someone else to the top and everyone just keeps going higher and better and bigger. And then it's just an incredibly successful model. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's amazing.
Um, I think relatively quickly, as I uh, knew you more and more, you got more and more interested in the environment. And I think you became aware and did a little bit of work with the American Conservation Coalition. Um, Tell us a little bit about why the environment matters to you and and what what it is that you you kind of doing now with the with the bca yeah so i think i think the main thing is that everyone instinctively cares about the environment right it's it'd be pretty abnormal for someone to look at a beautiful landscape and be like oh let's tarmac that or something like that it's a pretty instinctive human emotion and and i think that for a long time and, and i know a lot of people that felt this as well is that Oh, I always felt like, oh, I'm, I'm pretty center right, pretty classical liberal, except on the environment, because capitalism can't protect the environment or markets can't protect the environment. And so I always had this idea that the market was the exception where it needed government protection. And, and obviously there's a degree of that, but, but I soon came to realize as I was, was learning more about it was that there's actually ways that you can incentivize market actors and the, and and people to take care of what they own better and to be more responsible within a market setting. And, and that kind of realization came when I uh, first encountered the American Conservation Coalition. Uh, it was via Twitter. And, and I was like, oh, so I'm like a classical liberal and I care about the environment. And all of a sudden, here's an organization saying that I'm not abnormal, that, I'm, that, I'm, that there's actually a whole community out there for me. And so, so I started looking into their website and I was like, oh, wow, like, this is amazing. I had no clue that this existed, that, that there is actual, that there are actual, it's not just, oh, the free market will solve itself and that's it. There's actual real things you can pursue and actual real things you can fight for and promote. Um, and so, so I, was, I was incredibly happy to kind of find a political home there, uh, combining my political beliefs with my kind of more emotional, instinctive love of nature, having always like, gone to my grandparents lake house in the summer and living in the English countryside it's just it was able to combine my two passions there um, and um, and so I got involved with with ACC as a volunteer uh, as a communications researcher and then and then I thought you know what we could use something like this in the UK as well because they kind of took the US by storm and they positioned themselves as kind of the student movement mm-hmm. on market environmentalism and I thought well we could really use something like this in, in, in the UK. And I kind of pitched the idea to you, to uh, Maz, who, who was still the regional director at that point, um, and a few other of the SFL guys that I'd been um, working with. And everyone loved the idea. And, and they loved it not only because they also instinctively care about the environment, but they, also because they saw an opportunity. And that's kind of the, the SFL business model working, is that mm-hmm. you, you identify opportunities and you fill a gap in the market, whether it be a business gap or a kind of social movement political gap. And so we filled that, um, we thought this is a really good opportunity for us to um, use the environment as not only something where we can promote our ideas and really kind of start building a, a counter movement to what we see like Extinction Rebellion, but also to provide a kind of an entryway to other classical liberal and market principles to say that, look, if these people start accepting that the market is actually pretty good at coming up with solutions to environmental problems, then maybe the next step in their awakening will be that the market is good at solving other problems. Mm. And so, so that was kind of our, our thought process is, is on the one hand, this is something we all care about the environment and there's a gap in the market here. And the second thing is that, that we all care about our politics and this is an ideal way to kind of package that mm. and to, to bring up, bring across a positive message for these ideas rather than like, for example, the apocalyptic fear mongering that you see of Extinction Rebellion. And so, so that's how we kind of founded BCA. And then that, like, the impetus was that for that was not only the kind of direct ACC inspiration, but also the whole business model that SFL had been instilling within us. Yeah, brilliant. And it's all happened so fast. I remember um, having discussions with the other co founder, Maz, and you, and just it all just got, came together really quickly, like putting mm. a website together, getting, you know, a crew of, of people that are actually interested together. Amazing. Just amazing what like has happened so far. Like talk about the, 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 the 
the successful things that have, have come out of it so far and maybe going into the future, what does the British uh, Conservation Alliance have in store for the future? Yeah, I think the first thing that I should say here is when you're building an organization or a movement, they, they say you always need two types of people. You need kind of like the visionary driver mm. who can like make the things happen, who can like see this is where I want to be and that's where I'm going to push for and, and the like en enthusiastic person really like making things happen. But then you also need uh, the kind implementer. of... Implementer. Sorry? Yeah, the, the implementer. implementer and, yeah. and the logistics guy and, and the guy who can be like, okay, hang on, how can I best package this and make this work on a log from a logistical perspective perspective to allow your vision to happen exactly and so i couldn't have done it without maz because maz was able to be like okay well we need branding we need a good logo we need a color scheme we need a website here i'm going to set up a G Genius. Suite email so when you reach out to people it's not just like chris.barnard at gmail.com it's <laughs> yeah. chris at pca.eco exactly. and all of a sudden you you're building like a professional brand and i think that really attracted a lot of people to it as well because um as soon as we were like um recruiting people we like we weren't just like oh here's an idea come it was like here's an idea and a website and you get an email and you get all these things that show we're actually serious about mm. what we're doing uh, and that was just completely maz to maz's credit and he could do the graphics he could do the launch video i, could, I can't do any of that mm. um so so i was able to just throw the ideas at him and he turned them into real results so so credit where credit is due is is really with with maz there and and um and so then in terms of how we kind of exploded as you said um i think we were able to really successfully tap into the sfl network um so firstly we we basically got all the current sfl leaders in the uk to sign up to the idea and to become campus coordinators or to join the team as a policy researcher or a communications director or something like that and so we basically started building a team and i think in many ways because sfl already had that batch of leaders they all were able to quickly identify the opportunity we had here. So they were more than happy to join. And so they kind of bandwagoned onto it. And then we started really creating a team with responsibilities and roles and, and, and kind of playing ideas off each other in like late night calls and things like that. So that's where it kind of started spiraling. Um, and so then we just had people reach out to friends or people on social media to, to join the campus network. So we, we rapidly have grown that to, Turkey, around the universities yeah. across the UK. Fantastic. Um, and then we, and then also I think that this is where the SFL network has been especially useful. Um, we basically told the SFL leaders in Europe being like, look, we're setting up this project. If you, if we can do anything together, then, then make sure to, um, to, to let us know. And all of a sudden everyone was like, Oh, do you want to come speak at our conference in Israel or at our conference in Italy or, and then, and it just kind of, people were so intrigued by this idea because it's been lacking for so long. Mm. And then all of a sudden we were the preeminent experts on the environment within the Liberty movement. And so any kind of um, uh, conference where they wanted an angle or an article or something from that perspective, they asked us immediately. So it was like, we had a social media that was full of like, we're a month old, but our president is going to Germany to speak at a top hundred retreat. And people were like, whoa, wow. Like that's really starting to explode. And so we were quite lucky with the SFL connection there. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, it's just kind of, we've used that network also with other think tanks and, and things like that um, to really, to really snowball. Um, then one project that, that has really start, like set the tone for what, what we are as an organization as like a trendsetter in the political debate is um, the, the Austrian economic center, a former SFL are there shows the network, uh, Kai Weiss, he, he has always had this kind of uh, love for the environment and trying to kind of come up with market solutions. And he saw, he saw our founding and he was like, Oh, I should reach out and we can maybe work on a project together. So he, so he reached out because Maz already knew him and we had a conversation and we were like, Oh yeah, we can maybe put like a pamphlet of 15 pages together on, on what like market in, free market environmentalism looks like. And, um, and we were like, okay, yeah, sounds interesting. Why not? I mean, at that point, we were, I think, a month old, and I didn't know, like, if we had the expertise to write mm -hmm. a pamphlet, let alone <laughs> what it's now turned out to be a book. Um, but so we, we just said yes. We were like, we weren't afraid to go out and be bold and say, yes, we're going to do this. And then we started brainstorming and inviting other people into it. And before we knew it, we had 21 authors from 15 of the most important influential think tanks and organizations around the world in the liberty movement, contributing chapters, 
and it, and it turned out to be a 160 page book which we're ready to pub which we're ready to launch uh, next month um, and it just kind of showed us as the trendsetter for a new type of environmentalism mm. um, and so that was again an SFL connection that just off of one small um, conversation it turned out into a big project with launch book launches around the world um, and being able to to really have when anyone asks us now so what do you stand for what do you do what are solutions from your side for the environment it's like here's our manifesto yeah. 150 page long <laughs> love that and have a read and then get back to us exactly um, forwarded by dan hannon as well which is yeah amazing. forwarded by dan hannon and and having like reason foundation the cato institute perk adam smith institute center for policy studies like all these massive names contributing chapters and wanting to like help us promote it so yeah i think that's that's been a big like drive for our success recently yeah super excited about all this let's reverse a little bit let's talk about the the counter to free market environmentalism like you've got greta thunberg with her um i don't what are they called friday something friday where they all rebel on a Friday in, from school and you've got Extinction Rebellion who are basically their goal is to smash capitalism. Let's call a spade a spade. Um, what would you say is the, the qualitative difference between uh, a BCA and that whole movement that, that sort of really wants to go for the juggler in terms of smashing capitalism and getting rid of the free market basically? what's left of it yeah i think i think the most important thing to remember is the honesty of what actually is what we actually want to achieve and we're very clear about we want to um be in line with with uh, mitigating climate change and, and global warming to the ipcc 1.5 degrees by 2050 and we're very clear that that's a goal we want to uh, protect biodiversity and, and landscapes in the UK. That's a goal. But when it comes to something like Extinction Rebellion, uh, it's not actually an environmental goal. It's, it's, it's a, a system change goal. It's a social, political, economic goal that kind of uses the environment as a kind of justification, as a vehicle. And so so the, the founder of Extinction Rebellion, Stuart Basden, he, he wrote an article on Medium, uh, medium.com, saying Extinction Rebellion is not actually about the climate. It's about dismantling capitalism. It's about overthrowing the way of life as we currently know it. It's about returning to a kind of pre-industrial age where we're all in harmony with nature. And, and I, think, I think there's a big problem there where people are starting to see through their dishonesty. It's not, I mean, I'm sure there's many people in Extinction Rebellion that are genuinely worried about the planet and environmental issues, but the direction of the leadership is very much that we're going to overthrow the way of life as we know it and we have to go against capitalism and and so it's so they're, they're quite dishonest in the way they talk about it and and their issue is that because of that they alienate a very large segment of the population who doesn't feel like they have to give up their way of life to give up the kind of prosperity they've reached and, and the comfort of their lives for a kind of utopian goal they just don't think that that's that that's a fair thing to be asked of them and so, so Extinction Rebellion have managed to recruit a very loud portion of people that people that are, that are quite extreme and, and, and that are willing to go glue themselves to public transportation rather than the actual people that we need to make daily changes to their lifestyle or to be more sustainable in what mm. they do because the market offers them ways to do that. Mm. And, and, um, and so, for example, uh, what we very much emphasize is that it is possible to be economically prosperous and econo economically stable and at the same time have strong environmental commitments and environmental stewardship we do, we say that your your uh, prosperity and and a good environment a healthy environment are not mutually exclusive and i think that's something that resonates with a lot of people because they instinctively want to protect the environment but they also don't want to give up their 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 general lifestyle um, and so, so we very much emphasize kind of the optimistic vision, the forward looking positivity of that message. Yeah. And the fact that, that, um, that we will come up with the innovation necessary and we don't have to go back to a pre-industrial age and that you're not a Nazi because you drive a car, but mm. that here, we're going to let you drive a car that's clean. And that's how we do it. Not by just stopping you drive a car in the exactly. first place. 
and so so that's very much where we've kind of positioned ourselves uh, ourselves in opposition to uh, what extinction rebellion promotes let's get into the weeds a little bit about the some of the innovations that you foresee being possible to create this green market revolution that uh you know is the name of the book um like nuclear energy is one of the things that a lot of people are fearful of and we had colin megson on uh one of my uh, podcasts a couple of months ago and he's big on this specific um new generator coming out that's going to be able to produce uh a lot of energy for a really small uh amount of resources and almost carbon neutral so what other innovations do the bca really want to promote and and push forward that are coming online yeah i think there's there's two main things to address here so first you mentioned nuclear i think that's a perfect example of of where you have to look at facts and evidence rather than emotions and and the green movement has a long history of opposition to nuclear because it doesn't sit quite right with their kind of utopian green vision because nuclear is not something that is, it's, it's something where you do to an extent manipulate a force of nature and use it for your, for your interests. And it's, it's not like something, it, a nuclear plant doesn't grow naturally. It's mm. just, it's something that you have to create and it might seem at odds with nature, but actually what we emphasize is that nuclear can actually uh, contribute to protecting the environment because it's a clean energy source and it, it requires far less land and resources than for example solar panels or wind turbines and that yes it is not like it is not something that is completely natural in the sense of like it wouldn't just arise on itself but it is a very efficient innovative way of harnessing energy to allow us to meet our human needs at the same time as protecting the environment a uh, similar thing is is uh, biotechnology and GMOs. Um, there's there's a lot of opposition, for example, from Greenpeace against GMOs, and they lobby governments for regulations to block GMOs. Like the European Union, essentially impose a moratorium on any new GMOs coming to market. Mm. Whereas our point is that okay, yes, GMOs are similar similarly not a natural thing, not a utopian green thing, but it is a way of effectively making crops more abundant of making them use less water less land less pollutants and so if you look at the end result is that you end up with um with uh, an agricultural system based if it's based on gmos that is a lot cleaner and can produce food for the billions of people around the world mm. and and that having an emotional response to that is not actually helpful to the debate mm. and and so we very much promote those evidence-based solutions that are rooted in innovation rather than rooted in, in emotion. Um, but when it comes to other solutions, I think one of the things is if you believe in, in the market process, then you can't actually promise what the innovation will be because that's the whole point of a market is, is what Hayek calls decentralized knowledge. Yeah. It's, it's that you'll, the market will, through a process of, of decentralized actors, coming up with the innovation of one individual's brain and then develop, developing it into a business or, or, or something that that is how you will come up with the innovation necessary, but you can't just pretend Predict. that a bureaucrat yeah. or one individual will know what that will look like because then you're never going to come up with the innovation. It's not, it's not a top down centralized uh, mandate. It's a bottom up grassroots kind of Beautiful. Uh, decentralized process. Yeah. And, and so we can't promise what the next big innovation is, but we can promise that the human brain, has historically always come up with innovations and it will do that again. Yes. And, and we have to, we have to not look at the specific solutions, but we have to look at the ways to incentivize and make those solutions far more likelier than they currently are. Now this is where me and you ideologically might part ways because in some ways, you know, you kind of have to get your hands dirty with government and that gives me sort of the creepy crawlies and I, it feels a little bit uncomfortable. So what, what ways can it, governments and what ways do governments stifle these types of innovations from coming to market? Yeah. And I mean, I'm, I'm very pragmatic about that. I'm not, I'm not an, an ANCAP. I don't, I believe that there is some place for government and I think that it should be a limited effective government. And so the way I see it, especially when you're trying to kind of reach across the environmental aisle and you want to get as many people on board as possible, if you're going to tell them, well, 
my ideal world is an ANCAP world, then you're unlikely to get many people to agree with you and to kind of build a consensus. So I think that that maybe um, <laughs> I think that what that the way that the government can incentivize these these uh, kind of solutions to uh, environmental issues is by taking back a step and looking at all the things that it has currently in place, the regulations, the taxes, the, the, the kind of codes and laws that influence how the market works. It should be looking at which ones most distort the ability to come up with solutions. So for example, in the book, we talk about how we should be using clean tax cuts that specifically give a tax cut to um, businesses that will come up with clean technology. Mm. And it seems completely counterproductive to want to reach a world with no carbon emissions and at the same time to carbon uh, to tax the very yeah. technologies necessary to reach there. And so those are the kind of things that, that we look at. Another thing is um, um, energy choice and competition. Is In Texas, for example, they did studies that, that um, competitive power markets are much more likely to reach clean um, energy at a lower cost than monopoly markets where there's no incentivize, incentive to self-innovate. Mm. And so, so that's something where we, where we promote choice and competition within a, a marketplace that then rewards companies that do what the consumer wants, which is a cleaner energy source. Mm. And so, so we look at those market incentives to how to, um, how to incentivize going, going towards a cleaner future rather than uh, allowing the government to pick winners and losers. And then because of that, creating one big loss in the end anyway. Yeah, amazing. It's really exciting. Um, for anyone who might be watching this and might be a student, um, how can they get involved? What, what, what way can um, they get their hands dirty with the BCA? What sort of things would they be doing on campuses? Yeah, the, so our main, our main um, uh, port of call for students is our campus network. So on our website, you can, um, you can on, the, on the join tab, you can find a, a short application to become a campus coordinator. And, and essentially when you, then, then you apply and then there's a, a short discussion with our campus director. And, and as a campus coordinator, you essentially represent the BCA on your university campus. And we support you in flying the flag of market environmentalism. So if you want to organize a debate, between Extinction Rebellion and someone from BCA will try and help you organize that. We'll try and facilitate that. If you want to have a discussion on nuclear energy, we'll try and arrange for an expert on nuclear energy to go to your university and speak on that topic. Um, and so, so we, we try to support our campus coordinators to be effective communicators of what market or if you want conservative environmentalism looks like and how to, how to be an effective leader for that on your campus and present those ideas and kind of provide a counterbalance to the Extinction Rebellion narrative. So if you are a conservative or a libertarian or a classical liberal student at university, we'd love for you to come on board because, um, because we think that you're our best way of counterbalancing this narrative that conservatives, classical liberals and libertarians don't care about the environment. That we do, we have real solutions and students are the best people to uh, wave the flag of of our uh, of our solutions amazing now you're not just a one trick pony a lot of people might not know this but you are a semi professional football player as well yes. uh, a bit of a uh, goal scoring midfielder tell us tell us about your your football career and and who you've played for and and where it is now unfortunately there's no football happening so um I don't know. Are you in retirement? Where Where is it now? <laughs> <laughs> um, so football has always been a massive part of my life. Um, my 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 dad played football, and and then as soon as I could run, we we played football together. And then when I was five, I joined the local team in my village. Um, and um, I've always been driven and ambitious. So I wanted to see how far I could get. Um, so, so I got scouted away to a, a bigger club and then scouted to a bigger club from there. And so from the age of five, I was kind of always doing football three times a week, games on Saturday. Uh, my whole family was kind of involved in that. 
um and so then then um yeah i would just basically be combining it with my school and and i always wanted to be a professional footballer and so then when when um when i finished high school i uh, i decided to kind of take go on an adventure and and move to england and i trialed with uh, fulham uh, which was a which was a really amazing experience because there i uh, i was playing with players like ryan sessegnon who now plays yeah. in the premier league and i the 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 goalkeeper was Jose Mourinho's son, and wow. and so I was like with all these with all these people, and it's, it, I mean I didn't I, I didn't end up getting into Fulham because um, I was quite short and small, and, and English football is quite physical. Mm. But they put me in touch with an academy um, in in West Sussex, which basically um, was happy to accept me, and it was it was an academy to get players into the professional game. And so I kind of went there. I started going to the gym. I'd never gone to the gym, but I started going to the gym, started bulking up, all those things. And then um, at that point, I I, um, I was scouted by um, a club in the in the national league, which is um, basically it is basically a professional league, but a few tiers down in mm. in the UK system, uh, Dover. And uh, and I went to to Dover to the academy, but within a few months, I got. Um, I got asked to join the first team and I was training with them. And then I was given my first kind of official contract, which was 18 months long. Um, and so that was a really exciting part, like time of my life, uh, like training with like these professional football players. Like they were traveling, we were traveling across the country, going to games, things like that. Like fans would ask for my picture. It was really, it was a really cool experience. Um, and so then I was actually professional. Um, but then I, at the same time, I've always had this kind of academic interest. So I went to university at the same time, um, when I went out on, on loan to a, a club in a lower tier as young players tend to do. So I was able to combine that with my university. Mm. Um, and then, so I was doing university alongside football, but then, um, I was focusing a lot on university and starting to focus less on football because it can be a very difficult game as well. And, and I wasn't getting any chances with the first team because obviously all these players that were older and more experienced. And so um, I ended up not renewing my contract and just going to a club at a lower level, at a semi-professional level. And so that's basically where I've been playing for the last two years. Uh, and I've been ab able to easily combine it with my school and with BCA and things like that. So that's been really good. Um, and so, but now here we are with the Corona virus. So the season was cut short about two months which is frustrating but so yeah that's kind of my my journey yeah awesome awesome i remember you you told me at the start you model your game on or you, you fancy yourself as a bit of an ngolo Kante. yeah yeah interesting great player yeah no he is um yeah this is great so what does the future hold for for christopher barnard um well i'm i'm um I'm finishing my master's right now at the London School of Economics. Um, I've got my dissertation due in September. Um, and, and then I'll just be mainly focusing on waving the flag of market environmentalism around the world and, and growing the BCA and, and, and working with our partners across, across the world and things like that. So I'm, I'm just very excited about having kind of like more time to commit to it and and start getting the funding to have full-time staff members and things like that. So that's very much the direction that we, uh, that we hope to head in. Absolutely. It's really exciting. Christopher, thank you. Thank you for doing this. I really appreciate well, it. It's been amazing. Thank and you. I will talk to you all very soon.